Hi, and welcome to the second uh, session of um, this year's series, uh, Digital Materialities. The webinar, which has been going on for three years now, um, aims at um, looking at uh, material culture in conjunction with a series of disciplines. So the first year we looked at uh, material culture and history. The second year, uh, we looked at visual and material culture. And this year, we're looking at uh, literature and text and materiality. And um, it was my wish also to explore uh, the immateriality of, of text. And therefore, I contacted people in the Frontière du littéraire um, research hub at LARCA. Uh, for suggestions of people working on these topics. And I'm very grateful to Abigail Long for reaching out to uh, our literary colleagues and putting me in contact with Martin, um, who is currently um, doing a PhD on the poet John Giorno under the supervision of Mathieu Duplay. Um, so uh, I don't know John Giorgio, uh, John Giorgio, so I'm very um, uh, eager to learn more about his work. Uh, today, he um, has been kind enough to open his, uh, um, uh, his specter uh, to um, sort of fit in with the theme of the seminar and look at materiality and immateriality. And he's going to look at uh, the performance poet in conjunction with meditation, early meditation recordings, which I'm also very uh, eager to learn about. So uh, we looked at the screen sharing and it was fine before. So hopefully it's gonna be the same. Mm -hmm. Martin, the floor is yours. Okay, so let me, let me start uh, by sharing my screen. Uh, and it should be uh, perfect. Two. Okay, great. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, hello. Uh, and before starting, I'd like to thank Ian Fento uh, for organizing uh, the seminar, as well as Abigail Lang, uh, who is in charge of the seminar uh, Frontiers of the Literary, uh, which co-hosts this session. Uh, and I hope that you'll find my presentation on um, uh, guided meditation uh, recordings and John Giorno's poetry interesting. On the front page of headspace.com, the website for the mindfulness company Headspace Health, uh, smiling colored shapes invite you to find more joy, um, get more good nights, and make every day happier. For $12.99 a month, uh, the Headspace app offers self-care tips, sleep counseling, and guided meditations to their more than 2 million paid subscribers. Through a blend of cognitive behavioral therapy, secularized versions of Asian religious practices, and a gamified interface, which takes users through gradually more intricate levels of meditation, it promises to alleviate stress and help people become more functional since the insight gained in meditation supposedly feeds back into a variety of emotional and social skills, like, quote, mindfully ending a conversation, maintaining a, maintaining a healthy body image, or improving self-esteem and self-discipline, unquote. In the meantime, Headspace aggressively pushes its product to businesses, desperately seeking to provide a humane workspace for their employees. The Headspace website has a whole section devoted to Headspace for Work, their solution for executives who want to, quote, unlock their team's full potential, and therefore avoid seeing their employees take too many sick days. Additionally, it ships its guided meditations to a diverse array of healthcare providers, airlines, and even to the Weight Watchers Diet Company, uh, which suggests that the flip side of mindfulness is the regulation of the body under the pressures of productivity and desirability. Since the beginning of the COVID pandemic, mindfulness apps have seen a surge in users. However, to this day, despite the claims made as part of their PR strategy, no rigorous scientific study has been able to prove their positive effects on mental health beyond placebo, 
or the established fact that breathing deeply temporally relieves stress. The crux of the issue uh, lies here. Since they offer no way out of the material conditions that produce mental disorders, mindfulness apps rest on the notion that the only thing people actually have control over is their thoughts. And that thoughts are things that can be materially shaped in order to produce positive feelings. The cousins of mindfulness apps, therefore, are the optimistic affirmations of Emile Gouy, famous in France for developing a method of auto-suggestion, or the positive, positive thinking method promoted by the so-called new thought movement, which claims that the goal of happiness can be achieved just by visualizing it with enough intent. Those philosophies or pseudoscientific theories share the belief that a person's thoughts when expressed clearly enough uh, will have an effect not only on their perspective on things, but also on their body and their environment. This is typical of wishful thinking, but also interestingly, since it probes the actual effects of words on the mind and on the body, it interrogates the boundaries of performative language. The question posed by the practice of meditation then is, to what extent can language shape the body or to what extent do language and the body translate into one another? Today, guided meditations occupy a clear cut niche in the world of self-help, somewhere, somewhere between the inspirational stories of LinkedIn posts and the sanctimonious lessons of TED Talks. However, their predecessors date as far back as the 1950s and 1960s and branched from a category of vinyl records broadly defined as instructional, uh, which offered crash courses in fields as diverse as language learning, musical instruments, belly dancing, ventriloquism, or even survival and self-hypnosis. Somewhat disingenuously, those instructional records promised to teach complex skills in around 45 minutes, the average length of two sides of a disc in a long playing format. Their high replay value was their main selling point, since it was assumed that the learning process would take place through regular practice and repetition. Guided meditation recordings, which encourage a particularly committed kind of listening and guarantee profound psychological and physical changes if they're taken seriously, are no exception. In this presentation, I wish to investigate how the linguistic, vocal, and technological strategies of guided meditation recordings, as well as the poetic and artistic ventures that converse with them, might help us understand how those recordings attempt to navigate the interface between mind and matter, and between voiced instruction and embodied results. I'll first discuss the contents of meditation records to determine how they aim to recreate a listening situation analogous to the master and student relationship of spiritual training. And I will then look at the ways in which the concept of guided meditation influenced developments in the US poetry by conducting a case study of Suicide Sutra, a poem by John Giorno, which draws inspiration from the concept of guided meditation records and pushes it into an unprecedented participatory direction, synthesizing a long-standing reflection on performativity in poetry and contemporary art. Before starting, it's probably useful to clarify that the concept of meditation promoted by mindfulness apps and by those records somewhat differs from the traditional Western philosophical sense of the word. Indeed, the OED defines meditation as, quote, continuous thought or musing upon one subject or series of subjects, unquote. Rather, meditation or dhyana in Sanskrit should be understood here as almost the opposite of that conception of the word, since in a sense, it consists in training the mind not to think, either by intently visualizing an object without judging it or reflecting on it, or by consciously blocking all discursive thought. Inspired by yogic, Hindu, or Buddhist spiritual traditions, but severed from its religious roots, meditation practice was mostly popularized in the West in the 60s under the name transcendental meditation, by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who became at that time the spiritual advisor to the Beatles and to the Beach Boys, and spread it among their fans. Incidentally, on the sleeve of one of his records, uh, the Maharishi is careful to signal that, quote, everyone has the capacity for deep meditation, and that it is completely free from hypnotism and spiritualism, making it particularly accessible to a lay Western audience. Similarly, 
early guided meditation records, which mostly appear in the mid 1960s, almost all seem to legitimize themselves through references to Asian religions, but simultaneously assure that listeners that they have been voided of all religious content. So when the creators of the record are not Asian themselves, they usually exhibit signs of a privileged relation with Asia. For instance, the cover of Why Not Now by Alan Watts, a public speaker and author notorious for introducing the hippie counterculture to Zen Buddhism, uh, pictures him wearing a kimono and sitting with closed eyes in a small meditation shrine. Additionally, Watts could prove that he had followed formal training to become a Zen monk without, however, completing it. But a more extreme example of forcing identification with Asia is T. Lobson Rampa. Uh, indeed, Tuesday Lobson Rampa, who released a record entitled Meditation in 1969, was a pseudonym of Cyril Hoskin, the son of a plumber born in Devonshire, who alleged he was the son of a Tibetan Lama, and published several fake autobiographical works describing his upbringing in Lhasa, including colorful but completely invented details on the mystic powers of Tibetan Buddhist monks. The voice of the record is another factor that drives the personality of the speaker, and which should be given attention when studying such records. Although the sleeve of Rampa's record promises that, quote, the listener will benefit greatly from the very sound of the master's voice, his intonation and phrasing, unquote, it makes for a tedious listening experience. Indeed, overall, the, the talk sounds somewhat improvised, and the instructions, which are not very clear and uttered with erratic diction, are interwoven with unnecessary considerations on the supposed powers of meditation practice. Using that example as a benchmark to measure the, effect the effectiveness of such records, one finds that the most successful are those which exhibit the highest degree of vocal technique. In that respect, Richard Hedelman's Yoga Meditation from 1964 and Gordon Turner's A System of Meditation by Threefold Attunement from 1970 are records on which the voice is slow, clear, and assertive. Both records understand that in order to act as a convincing substitute to the master-student relationship of spiritual training, they must work with the properties of the acousmatic voice. That is to say, in the terminology of French composer Pierre Schaeffer, the voice which emanates from no discernible source. Brian Kane in Sound and Scene uh, writes that, quote, Schaeffer argued that the originary experience of acousmatic sound um, could be traced back to the school of Pythagoras. Etymologically, the term acousmatic refers to a group of Pythagorean disciples known as the acousmaticoi, literally the listeners or auditors, who as legend has it, heard the philosopher lecture from behind a curtain or veil. According to Michel Chion, Pythagoras used the veil to draw attention away from his physical appearance and toward the meaning of his discourse." Unquote. Therefore, paradoxically, the acousmatic voice is more authoritative than the embodied voice because it draws attention to the content rather than the context of the utterance, that context being provided solely by the utterance itself. Kane again writes that, quotes, the purpose of the acousmatic experience in the Schaeferian tradition is to change the way we hear, to draw attention from the source of the sound and onto its intrinsic audible properties, unquote. Therefore, vocal techniques such as those used in broadcasting, which emphasize the stereotype of a commanding, soft and resonant voice, work particularly well in the context of instructions for meditation. Some records even enhance those vocal properties through the use of audio tricks, such as reverb, which metaphorically expands the room where the listener sits and situates the disembodied voice in it as a ghostly presence. Incidentally, in Gordon Turner's record, reverb is introduced when the voice instructs you to, quote, lose the spatial limitations of your body, unquote. Though undoubtedly very kitsch, the association of the order and the sound effect here brings the material properties of the medium to the fore. Since the meditation is an escape from the material cons constraints of the body, the voice that accompanies it must also seem to free itself from its physical condition and become even more acousmatic, even less tethered to the technological app apparatus that conveys it. 
Most meditation records are alike in their promise of wonderful results. One affirms that meditation is the path to, quote, inner understanding and true peace, unquote. And another goes as far as claiming that, quote, if you can meditate correctly, then you will have no mental illness, unquote. However, listening to those records in succession leaves one with a confusing impression that a guided meditation could be anything that the speaker decides it to be. For instance, while one record might claim that the position one chooses for meditation is whichever one finds most comfortable, another asserts that sitting in the lotus position is of utmost importance for the success of the practice. Some may take listeners through a variety of exercises during which they are supposed to imagine themselves in a specific sensory setting, for instance, wading in shallow waters and rippling the surface, or climbing a ladder to the sun, while other records will instruct them to, quote unquote, become an object or a sound. Richard Hittleman's disc, Yoga Meditation, contains an exercise called Meditation with the Ear, whose instructions are, quote, you should listen to the following music in such a way that through complete absorption in the sounds, you lose yourself and become the music. If you are fully immersed in listening, there will be no thoughts and no you." Unquote. In the first case, the presence and agency of the body is affirmed since it becomes the projective vehicle through which the meditation is carried through. And in the other case, it is negated, negated at the same time as the ego is dissolved. Overall, at the end of each of those records, it remains unclear what any of those exercises aim to actually change in the mind or the body of the listener. While picturing oneself as a flower growing out of the ground may be a fun activity to practice while bored, it, it, it provides little in the way of a pursuit of inner peace or the treatment of anxiety or mental disorders, and seems even more pointless when it is not justified within the framework of a ritualized religious practice which ascribes it a codified meaning. Those ambiguities prompt us to stay, take a step back and consider how the concept of guided meditation was imported in other cultural areas. Consequently, I want now to turn to poetic interpretations of guided meditation as they unfold it in the US within a, a poetic context marked by a sustained dialogue with Asian, Asian religions. The interest in meditation as a concept and a practice is particularly prevalent in beat poetry and other poetic schools which sought to redefine poetry as a spontaneous body-based form. This interest grew partly because many of those poets who were already interested in mystic experiences became more and more involved in Buddhism. Among examples of poems which show them grappling with the concept of meditation is Jack Kerouac's How to Meditate, a short poem scribbled in one of his notebooks in 1954. The poem contains a confusing set of instructions, quote, when a thought comes a springing from afar with its health forth figure of image, you spoof it out, you spuff it off, you fake it, and it fades and thought never comes, unquote. Instead of providing structured guidance in the art of meditation, the poem essentially tells readers to cheat their way through it. Nevertheless, in the poem, Kerouac presents meditation as a source of chemically produced ecstasies, quote, the gland inside of my brain discharging the good glad fluid, unquote, which acts as a substitute to the artificial, artificial paradises of drugs. Kerouac's emphasis on freedom of form and immediate body response invites a parallel between his conception of meditation and the beat conception of poetry as spontaneous expression. In that sense, meditation becomes a means to an end, a useful practice for one who wants to broaden their creative writing range. On a very different note, the poem Suicide Sutra by Don Giorno, written in 1973, uh, performed and recorded multiple times, but never published in English before 1994, is an ideal subject for the discussion of the performative aspect of guided meditation since its participative dimension troubles the locus of its reading and action. John Giorno is a poet whose output is somehow difficult to classify because it operates within the very extended definition of poetry, encompassing page, stage, sound, image, and technology. His poems are characterized by an obsession with repetition, and in the beginning of his career, they were entirely composed by collaging bits of text 
appropriated from various sources like news articles or ads. He was also an astute performer of his own poetry, having developed a breathing technique which allowed him to give sustained performances of pieces which could last as long as 30 minutes. He's probably most famous for creating a poetry over the phone service pictured here called Dial a Poem. Uh, but his experiments with sound and technology also profoundly influenced his own writing. He first made audio tapes of his poems with Bowen Burroughs and Brian Geisen, and also worked with Robert Moog, creator of the Moog synthesizer in the late 1960s. Anne Waldman, another New York performance poet, recalls that, quote, Joyner experienced poetry completely orally. All the editorial decisions were based on how the work sounded, unquote. Suicide Sutra is a unique poem in Joyner's work, which synthesizes a reflection on performativity as it was being developed by contemporary art and poetry since the 1960s, as well as on the poet's own engagement with Buddhism, which began when he started to study under the guidance of Tibetan religious masters in exile in 1970. It's also this only poem of his which contains explicit instructions to be followed during its reading or its performance. Suicide Sutra begins with a short explanation of the basic premise of the poem. Quote, everyone is invited to participate in this poem. This is an audience participation poem. Please follow the instructions as you read them and tighten the muscles of your body. Tighten each individual muscle and hold it. You should become uptight, unquote. That indication to become uptight suggests a parallel between a somatic state of tension and a dispositional state of moral rigidity, mind and body aligned in the same nervous energy. As we'll see, uh, the same theme of blending body and mind states is developed throughout. The beginning of the poem conditions the audience and places them in a state of ignorance and impotence, as the voice intones and repeats, quote, you can't remember where you are, you haven't gotten who you are, you can't even remember what the words mean, and you want to change it, and you don't know how to do it. Then the audience is instruction, instructed to tighten their arms, started, starting with their fingers and going up their shoulders. The rest of the poem is interspersed with such instructions, and when the whole body is tightened, the listener is again told to, quote, go over your body and tighten the muscles that have loosened. Every muscle must be totally intensified. You are hard as a rock, unquote. In the meantime, listeners are confronted with excruciating images of confinement and pain, of wanting to scream, of not being able to, of being trapped in a, quote, doorless burning house, unquote, until they realize that, quote, there is a gun in your hand and it's pointing at your face and you pull the trigger, unquote. After that representation of a suicide, the pain continues. A variety of other horrible sensations are described until finally the subject ascends out of hell and is reborn effortlessly in cool air. The poem ends with the realization that, quote, you haven't gotten anywhere, only here, unquote. The primary thematic inspiration for Suicide Sutra is the concept of the bardo, that state between death and rebirth in Tibetan Buddhism, which is also the subject of the Bardo Thadol, the book mostly known in the West as the, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which contains advice on how to navigate the process of death and rebirth and instructions on how to guide the soul of the deceased so that they do not wander eternally in lower realms. But the originality of the poem is that it also draws inspiration from from and parodies guided meditation records. For instance, Richard Hillman's record yoga meditation, which I discussed earlier, includes a section entitled Deep Relaxation Through Awareness of the Body, during which the listener is told to, quote, become very aware of and relax their body parts in succession, and then to become aware of them once more when they have all been relaxed. Suicide Sutra actually blends that aspect of conscious body control with the visualizing strategies of guided meditations. Indeed, the poem actually contains two sets of instructions. The first one, marked by the imperative verb tighten, is explicit and concerns the listener's body. The second one is implicit and use the, it uses the gnomic present as a performative vehicle to convey the visualization of a mental state or a situation. 
just like the rhetorical strategies of a guided meditation directing the listener, for instance, to picture a color or to feel a sensation. However, none of those records go as far as prompting the listener to visualize the act of committing suicide, which would break the illusion of control of the mind over the body that guided meditations want to set up. The audio versions of the poem also play with the physicality of the sound in much more intricate ways than guided meditation records. At least two studio versions of the poem were produced, both released on compilations for the Giorno Poetry Systems record label. Both versions loop, delay, and repeat the voice of the speaker in multiple layers, which are panned from left to right and range from soft to loud, creating a disorientating frenzy of echoing voices, especially when listened to with headphones. This diffraction and spatialization of sound complements the echolalia already present in the poem with the stubborn repetition of several phrases. And if we compare it to the unified disembodied voice of God of guided meditation recordings, it multiplies the speaker's presence around the listener's body and evokes psychotic auditory hallucinations rather than the soothing guidance of a spiritual master. In the second version from 1975, the audio tracks are gradually brought back into sync at the end of the poem, leaving only an echo of a fraction of a second, which creates the impression that the voice reverberates inside the listener's head until it completely merges with itself. Thus, the material manipulation of sound produces the embodiment of the poem, as well as a met metaphorical parallel between the trajectory of the voice and the journey from death to rebirth in the poem. A final paradigm for reading Giorno's poem is the concept of the event score, which was developed by artists associated with the Fluxus movement in the early 1960s. Event scores consist uh, in a very, uh, often very short string of text describing an action to be performed and occupy an ambiguous space between poetry and art. Liscott, placing event scores within the lineage of John Cage's experimental music notation, describes them as, quote, inseparably words to be read and actions to be performed, unquote. However, unlike Suicide Sutra or Guided Meditations, many event scores strove to erase themselves as artistic production and aim to collapse the distinction between art and life. An example is George Brecht's piece entitled Exit, which in, in essence is being performed every time anyone exits any space. However, event scores share with Giorno's more controlled poem what Cotts, quoting Lawrence Wiener, calls the, quote, activation of the reader, or in other words, the performative positioning of a viewer, reader, or listener within the context of the piece. In that regard, the very final lines of Suicide Sutra, which say, quote, you haven't gone anywhere, only here, contains uh, not just a metaphor of the end of the cyclic process of karmic rebirth, but also an explicit positioning of the listener in relation to the speech act of the poem. To summarize, guided meditations recordings um, operate on the basis of two contradictory assumptions. The first one is that the mind and the body are inextricably connected and uh, that changes in one also produce change, changes in the other. The second one, however, is the illusion that the mind through careful guidance can project itself onto other objects and become those objects, therefore separating, it, separating itself from the body. Proper guidance is key to the sustenance of that illusion, and without the availability of a spiritual master, the recording must provide a vocal center convincing enough to carry the meditation through. If listened to in any other way than the ori one originally intended, guided meditation records exhibit a charming kitschiness which stems from the absurdity of their instructions um, and performative descriptions. Thus, as material artifacts, they fall prey to misuse and open up to creative appropriations. John Giorno's Suicide Sutra is one reinterpretation which confronts the new age content of guided meditation records with the actual goal of spiritual training in Tibetan Buddhism, that is, the preparation to face suffering and death. But one can also imagine what a guided meditation would sound like if the record was broken and the, listen and the listener perpetually stuck in limbo, expecting new instructions from the voice of their analog master. 
Also, hearing their digital reproductions channeled through a computer, uh, as I did, makes them fall prey to becoming what Stephen Shredman, discussing the afterlives of poetry recordings on the internet, calls ambient poetry. In his book, American Poetry as Transactional Art, he writes on, quote, thinking about the poetry reading audio file as a form of ambient music in which the sonic saturation of spoken language creates a habitable environment akin to that constructed by the richness of musical sound, unquote. Comparing the experiences of hearing a poet reading live and listening to it on a computer, he notes that, quote, with an audiophile of a poetry reading, though, there is no actual poet, no audience, and no possibility of locating oneself within the physical space of the reading. Listening to an audiophile is a situational activity in which a steady word of flow of words takes place for a period of time, often in the presence of other files and applications on a computer, and alongside events within the present location of listening. In essence, an audio file is most often encountered as a form of ambient music. It creates an all-over sonic environment that shuttles back and forth between foreground and background of awareness." Unquote. In other words, even if the voice of guided meditation is properly calibrated, the material situation of the listener matters more, as well as their willingness to partake in the exercise. Within that potentially infinite realm of possibilities where the performative misses its mark and has no real world effect, meditation instructions collapse into background noise. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I can't find my clapping thing. <laughs> so I'll clap like this. Um, thank you very much. I'll start with, with one question um, coming from my um, non-expertise, but interest in um material culture and the technology because you mentioned um several on several occasions the uh, the technology yeah. of these recordings and like in your conclusion about the new way we listen and you you have come about listening to these tracks um on a computer um and i was wondering whether in in, in the both corpuses you looked at that is um, the meditation recordings, those, those LPs, and then the appropriation of that or reappropriation of that in in uh, John Giorno. Um, how much of um, um, uh, of an issue or a concern that was uh, the the kind of materiality on how it was recorded? The studios, were there particular studios that specialized in this? Were there particular material settings in which it was seen as better to record these meditation uh, guides? Um, and for the poetry part, uh, was it taking a different approach? Like, no, it shouldn't be in a kind of muffled um, professional studio, it, 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 or was it trying to? Um, imitate or appropriate the same technical means, the, the same technology for the recordings? Mm -hmm. um, well, um, it's, it's actually kind of difficult to answer that question because there are no indications on, on the conditions uh, of recording uh, those, those meditations. Uh, usually on on the back of the of the of the of the cover of the sh uh, of the sleeve of the record, uh, you have you know recording at this and that studio and that's all. Uh, but when you listen to them, it's 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 clear that the audio setup is um, is is the same as you would expect for an audiobook, for instance. Uh, very clear voice, uh, no background noise whatsoever. Um, uh, I don't know the proper engineering terms for it, but but the voice has been has been enriched in some way. Maybe some frequencies have been enhanced uh, to to make it more present, like like on the radio, basically. Um, and um, 
I don't know for other poets. I mean, yeah, I do know for other poets, but for, for John Giorno, um, it doesn't sound as, um, as carefully recorded as that. I mean, many of his recordings are actually uh, live recordings and, and, and he would use uh, a, a whole technology, technological apparatus to, uh, to accompany his performances, uh, like delay pedals or stuff like that, and, um, and then record it live. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm, I can't really um, say any more about the, the actual recording conditions of the record, other records. Thank you. That was really a curiosity question. Mm -hmm. um, so sorry, I, I started with the questions, but obviously uh, you are most welcome uh, to please, please, uh, you can switch your cameras back on if you want, uh, and certainly your sound back on if you want to ask uh, Martin a question. Yes, I think, I believe you're not called Martin really, but you're Tony? Uh, yes. Oh, goodness. <laughs> um, um, I, just a question, Martin. Um, I, I'm really... Um, you ended on, on the idea that the, the guided meditation becomes ambient noise, and you, but you, you mentioned this Cajun um, strategy, and it just struck me that how it sort of circles back on itself um that the um the effort put into these guided meditations and the aspiration embodied by these recordings comes back to cage in this you know in four four minutes 33 seconds just um the voice silent and the and the environment speaking. Hmm. Well, um, Cage was was a practitioner of Buddhism, so he was obviously familiar with with meditation, uh, and and he was very influenced by the I Ching and 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 uh, um, and by Zen meditation also. So so I guess there is by definition an element of Zen Buddhism in his performances. I mean in his um, in his compositions. So. So maybe that explains the link. Uh, <laughs> well, it was just yeah. it was just your it was just your 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 critical remark at the end where you spoke mm -hmm. about how the um, the guided meditation voice just um, what do you say is it it's not degraded but it's um, it's absorbed by the environment in other words mm -hmm. it has, it no longer has the it no longer has the the guiding um, uh, it no it, it no longer serves its purpose. Mm -hmm. It's just ambient. Well, well, I as I experienced it, it, it was not completely ambient because I had to to write down what was, what was actually said in those records, uh, but I didn't do the exercise. So so in a way, the the, the performative aspect uh, missed missed its mark completely. Uh, so, so maybe that was that that uh, that is what I was getting at at the end of the of the presentation. Mm, okay. Yeah, like more more on the on the performative side of it. That I didn't actually follow the instructions. Okay. Yeah, Matthew, go ahead. Uh, yes, I have a I have a question as well. Um, and it's 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 very difficult not to uh, think about Cage when 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 listening to your to your presentation. Um, uh, Cage is everywhere, and and at the same time, Cage is nowhere because, uh, uh, of course, you're describing something that is actually very much at odds with what Cage was interested in. I mean, Cage was you know notoriously hostile to recorded sounds, um, and uh, he he uh, I think they're actually. Uh, 
uh, essays or, or pieces where he, he he says that he doesn't see the point of the gramophone uh, and uh, uh, because uh, because a, a good piece of music or a good perform you know musical or artistic performance is is something that happens only once and and uh, it doesn't really make any kind of sense to try and keep a, a recording of it and uh, and if you do uh, it's it's like you know a postcard uh, of, of a famous you know monument or a place that you've visited it, it reminds you of an occasion in in the past but it doesn't it doesn't constitute a, 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 an acceptable sort of substitute for for the work itself um so so i was i, I was actually wondering about that uh, uh the uh, uh because because in in many other ways i mean the uh, everything that you said about meditation guided meditation uh, uh and 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 particularly the way uh this this is a practice that uh uh, uh that uh, actually uh, is in a sense the opposite of traditional meditation in the sense that it doesn't focus the attention um it, it tries to 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 prevent a, a, any any actual thoughts from 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 taking shape all this is of course very close to what uh, Cage says in pieces like Lecture Nothing, where, where he says that the point is to keep the mind um, as idle as possible. What does the mind do having nothing to do? Um, it's a question that resonates there. So Cage is 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 he's you know very close to what you were talking about, and at the same time very uh, remote. And I was uh, and, and it seems to me uh, I'm sort of working my way towards a question about the status of recording. And uh, and the function of recording, um, uh, because uh, it seems to me that Cage is uh, at the same time um, saying that he doesn't like recorded sounds, um, and that he prefers live sounds and live performances of um, whatever music, poetry, you know, you call it what you want. Um, at the same time, he he's uh, uh, interested in in uh, undoing the link between the live performance and the uh, kind of uh, metaphysics of presence that tend to tends to underlie okay the practice or, or the belief in in live performance in in a lot of uh, art music or classical music or music generally um, and. Uh, uh, the impression I, I have is that is that you're um, in in a certain sense looking at uh, at uh, practices that do the the opposite, and and not um, emphasize uh, uh, recordings as 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 ways of maybe um, uh, suggesting the presence of something. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can be the presence of another person, the subjectivity, uh, 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 as kind of you know Zen master, you know, sort of instructing you in how to meditate, uh, or maybe possibly it could be the presence of you know the voice itself, mm -hmm. uh, the, the the voice as 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 found object, um, uh, the acu the the acousmatic voice as as a found object that doesn't actually have a a source but that that has a presence of its own okay which is uh in, in, in a sense i would say probably maybe the, in, the the opposite of what cage was talking about i don't know if this makes any sense uh, these are kind of sort of complex thoughts that came into my mind when i was listening to you so sorry for for you know expressing myself in such a <laughs> circuitous way well, yeah, yeah, that, that that makes sense. I mean, the 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 things that that comes into my mind when uh, that came into my mind when you were talking uh, is the idea that that uh, those records must must absolutely sustain that illusion of of presence uh, for them to work. Otherwise, otherwise, it's it's completely uh, nulled, nullified, um, and. And what's really paradoxical about it is that at the same at the same time as you're supposed to erase everything that's happening in your mind, there's a voice telling you that you need to do something with your with your mind. Uh, so um, so I, I don't know how how those things you know um, uh, pair or or clash or conflict, but but yeah, I, I thought there was a paradox here also mm -hmm. not just in the the, the disembodied sound uh that uh that makes it uh that that uh wants to 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 seem present even though it's not uh but also in the the actual instructions uh that are given by by the records hmm. 
Uh, also, I was, I was wondering about something else, which is that you, you said you listened to the, the recordings and you actually wrote down the words and, and you didn't do the exercises. But I mean, wasn't that a certain type of exercise in itself? Um, uh, uh, I mean, you disobeyed the explicit instructions, but it's a certain way of uh, at the same time focusing and emptying the mind, uh, listening to listening to the words and, and just writing them down. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're not your own. So well, it works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's also a certain experience of poetry, I guess. So, mm -hmm. well, um, another thing that comes to my mind is the idea to 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 go back to poetry, not to those guided meditation recordings. Is that when poetry re records uh, came out in the nineteen fifties, uh, 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 poets reading their own poems uh, on vinyl. Uh, those records were supposed to be listened to with very much intent. Uh, they were supposed to be uh, as 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 present as the uh, as the speaker, or or as um, as holy as a book almost. Mm. So you were supposed to have a communion with the voice of the poets when you listen to them. And and actually, when you when you read uh, uh, um, testimonies of people who actually. Uh, bought those records when they came out. This is how they record them. Uh, they they listen to them. Hmm. There's a question in the chat. I don't know, Martin, whether you want me to um, uh, read it. It's Anna who is supervising an exam, so she can't talk. Uh, so I'll read a question. Uh, do you use research in neuroscience to think about the way immersion serves the purpose of meditation as you defined in one of the quotes, no thought, no you, ego death? Can you talk more about the link between immersion in erasing the ego? Well, it, that, that's interesting because um, when you look at uh, apps such as Headspace, um, and it's not the only app. I mean, there are at least two other big names on the market. Uh, but the, on on those websites, they they say that they use neuroscience and that it provides the the, the foundation or the grounding uh, for um, for the effectiveness of their uh, of their apps. Um, I um, I'm actually not ver well versed at all in in neuroscience, so. Um, so I can't really answer that question, um, but uh, about the link between immersion and racing the ego, uh, I feel that's always an, an illusion. I mean, you can't really erase the ego uh, in any way. Uh, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe maybe someone will jump at me <laughs> right now and, and tell me I'm wrong. But but this is the yeah, this is how I feel that erasing the ego. Actually, when you're listening to instructions and 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 following those instructions, you can't really erase your ego. Otherwise, you're not really following those instructions. Um, I, I had a question um, uh, on, uh, and maybe this is completely uh, uh, not the right the right time frame, but um, listening to you, I was thinking of the new kind of non-voice-based meditation uh, means uh, and I'm thinking of ASMR mm -hmm. um, like people listening to certain not necessarily words but either tonalities of voice or um, certain noises um, that are supposed to have like a soothing effect and a, a physical impact on the body triggering a sort of uh, tingling and and relaxation sort of bodily effect. Um, does that echo in any way with uh, with things you, you came across in, in your work? Um, not things I, I came across uh, because ASMR is really a recent phenomenon. Uh, so you can't really find a, a, an ASMR LP, <laughs> although that would be really, really fun. I mean, maybe a scratch record is, is ASMR in a way, um, but... Um, but they're not using any sort of... No, they're not, not using background any... Background noise, but sort of some... No, not, those triggers, no. Or, or no. No. Uh, but if you, if you look up guided meditation on YouTube, uh, 
you'll find that those two categories are actually very uh, interconnected. And, and then in the suggestion bar, you'll often find uh, uh, um, ASMR videos. Even though uh, those meditation things, they are supposed to heal you or, 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 or um, let you attain higher states of consciousness or whatever. But ASMR has this weird sexual notion also that uh, your, uh, your ears are also a, a, a gateway to, to, uh, to uh, sexual pleasure, to a form of sexual pleasure, I guess. Uh, because it's it tangles in your body, and then and then the commentaries on those videos are all, all, always or um, often uh, related to, to the effect of those noise on their on the body of people, and it's usually you know uh, women with with youthful voices uh, in front of their microphones uh, doing weird things with their hands and their microphones, and then and then uh, rumpling paper and all those uh, all all those things. So yeah, there's there's a weird kind of, of sexual thing happening here, which is not happening in in the guided meditation things that I, that I looked at. Thank you. I see Anna's put a link to because she she's uh, uh, worked a little bit on on ASMR for a thesis. Yeah, great. And Thank you, Hannah. Put Anna. a link to a useful article. I I had no idea that um, ASMR had this kind of sexual. Thing. I just thought it was people listening to relaxing noises. Well, it can be, but 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 uh, there, there's a thin frontier between the two, actually. Are there any more questions for for Mata? We have time for some more questions if you have them. I have one last question, maybe still on my question of the technology, because so those those um, uh, meditation uh, recordings. So you listen to them on the Internet, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering how much this may have had an effect on them becoming ambient and losing their power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, you you address that by saying it's also it's not just the construction of the message. It's also the context in which it is being received. Um, but I was wondering about, you know, the LP and how it's been digitized. I assume it's been digitized, mm -hmm. whether any of the particular LP noises of the um crackling or you know the dust and uh whether that there have been these have been removed uh from the recording so like you're listening to something that has no materiality of the lp uh left mm -hmm. um or whether uh in the recordings that you find online this materiality is somehow been kept because it's just been recording of an lp being played or whether it's been dusted if you wish it's been digitized and and remastered so that there's no uh, none of that um uh noise hmm. uh, well it, it depends but uh, um every every record that i listened to or managed to to listen to was a digitization of an lp so no no um uh no, no digitization from the master recording, uh, and and then the grades of the um, uh, of the recording uh, um, and digitization equipment probably has to do with uh, how much noise is still in in the thing at the end. Um, it, it, it's a lot of amateurs uh, putting putting stuff on on their YouTube channels, uh, for instance. Or, uh, or you have that uh, really uh, great website, archive.org, which has tons of books, but also recordings. And I found a few also uh, um, on there. And yes, you can hear a faint background crackling maybe, uh, but um, uh, since I guess the, the, the original records were in mint conditions or, or, or in a very good condition, it, it, it doesn't really affect the listening experience. And you don't have this throwback to the, the original materiality of the, of the record. 
and and obviously you don't have to uh, uh, to uh, get out of your chair and and then flip the record uh, once the <laughs> uh, once one one side has ended. So it's it's also a different experience. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you. So if there's no more questions, maybe we can thank uh, Martin again for his paper and um, his answers to the questions. Um, I'll announce uh, the next session, which is going to be uh, taking place on the 24th of um, January. It's always on Tuesdays. Um, a, a shift to a completely different topic. Uh, we'll be uh, hosting uh, Aude de Mesrac Zanetti, who's a, at the University of Lille, uh, and she's a historian of uh, religion, and she'll be talking about liturgical books used under Henry VIII and the annotations on them. Um, there will be another um, uh, talk uh, organized in conjunction with the la, 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 La Lax uh, Frontière du Littéraire mm. uh, in May or June. We're still trying to decide the date. Uh, and it will also be on uh, the materiality or immateriality of voice and text and also on the contemporary. Uh, and this will be announced. The title is still to be confirmed, but it will be announced on the mailing list. So uh, keep an eye out uh, on, on the mailing list uh, if you're interested. Thank you very much.